All right, we're just going to go ahead and begin with the uh, presentation. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining this call. Um, this will be an introduction to uh, InterSystems Health Connect. My name is Phil Anderson. I work here at Galen Healthcare Solutions. Uh, I've been here for a little over two years now. Um, I'm a technical consultant. I mainly focus on uh, building interfaces. I do additional work out of that, dealing with uh, some custom SQL work, but most of my work is around interfaces. Uh, previously, before working at Galen, I was working over at Athena Health uh, as an interface project manager. Um, also on the call today that you'll hear chime in every once in a while is Ryan Hunt. Uh, he's a managing consultant here at Galen. Uh, he's just going to be running a few polls just during the call, just so we can get a gauge of, of uh, some of the people that are on our, on our webcast today. So just a few housekeeping items. Um, you've probably already noticed that uh, everyone's phones are on mute. Um, I will be the only one talking today. Um, we also have a, uh, a Q&A. Uh, if you see in the top right, there's a button for the Q&A session. Uh, if you have any questions that you have uh, during this presentation, feel free to just post them uh, down at the bottom. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we will go through and uh, try and answer some of your questions. Uh, if I don't get to any of your questions today, uh, don't worry. Uh, I will try to respond to those as best as I can within the next couple of days. Um, so either I don't have time to answer them or I might want to, you know, do a little bit more research and provide you with a more uh, detailed explanation uh, or answer to your question. So just going over to the, the agenda of today's call. So first, we're just going to start with an overview of some of the uh, system requirements for uh, installing Health Connect onto your, uh, onto your network, um, and then also going over um, just briefly some of the uh, message standards and protocols that are available to you with Health Connect. Uh, then we'll just briefly touch on HealthShare, uh, what that is. Um, and then after that, we'll really go into uh, why we're all on this call today, Health Connect. Uh, within Health Connect, we'll touch on the management portal, uh, a production, so uh, basically your interface. Uh, we'll talk about message structure. Um, since we'll, we'll try to keep within HL7 today, uh, just because it's really the most common sort of uh, healthcare transaction within the healthcare space. So uh, we're going to stay with HL7, but we will touch on some other message structures as well. Uh, we'll talk about virtual document architecture. Um, then we'll go and talk about message processing, so message routing, data transformations, and acts. And then lastly, we'll talk about monitoring, uh, the different logs that you have, and a uh, system dashboard. Um, then I'll go ahead and do a demo uh, for everyone, and I'll touch on some of the things that we're going to be touch uh, talking about in the slides a little bit more. Um, and then we'll do, uh, I'll go over just uh, briefly show you some of the documentation that InterSystems will provide um, you um, as a resource. And then lastly, uh, we'll, we'll do a Q&A session. Uh, I'll go through some of the questions that, are, uh, that you submit, and I'll try to answer them to the best of my knowledge. So we're just going to start off uh, right off the bat with our first poll, uh, poll question. So uh, Ryan, if you don't mind. Thanks, Phil. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and open up the, the first of two polls today. So this first poll is asking, uh, which integration engine does your organization currently use? Um, so we have a couple options here, uh, ConnectR, Rhapsody, otherwise known as CIE, uh, Ensemble, otherwise known as Health Connect, Mirth, CorePoint, Cloverleaf, Iguana, or other. So I'll just leave that open for about a minute, and then I'll share the results. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Thanks to those of you who responded. Um, so it looks like we have a, 
pretty big Rhapsody or, or otherwise known as CIE uh, group today. We also have a few folks who currently use Ensemble and a couple of the folks who are on um, uh, Interface Engine not listed. So Phil, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, let me just go ahead and close the poll right there. All right, so just a quick overview of some of the system requirements uh, when installing InterSystems uh, Health Connect. Um, also, Cache, the database that, uh, that Health Connect is built off of. So, <clears throat> Health Connect basically runs on multiple different server platforms, uh, Mac OS, uh, OS 10, uh, 9 and above. Uh, Microsoft Server, Vista 7, 8, and 10, uh, multiple Linux uh, server platforms, uh, and Oracle Solaris. Um, it also runs on a bunch of different cloud pl platforms as well. Uh, during the presentation, we'll actually be running it off of uh, one of our test boxes, which is uh, hosted up in uh, Microsoft's Azure uh, cloud environment. Um, as you can also see that um, Health Connects also supports multiple different uh, data and message standards, uh, pretty common with the healthcare industry. They actually support all the um, healthcare industry uh, message standards, such so uh, HL7, V2, V3, and Fire, X12, uh, CDA, CCDs, CCDAs, uh, DICOM, XML, SOAP, and so on and so forth. Um, and then also a lot of the uh, standard connection protocols, such as FTP, TCP, file, HTTP, email, so, and then um, SQL with uh, JDDB, JDBC and ODBC connections. Those are tongue twisters. All right, so HealthShare. So what is HealthShare? So HealthShare is essentially InterSystems uh, health information uh, health informatics platform. So HealthShare is basically a family of products that enables your organization to, you know, capture uh, health and health related information from everyone that's kind of involved in your in or outside of your network. Uh, share that information amongst uh, amongst your organization. Uh, analyze and understand all that information and then also act on that information. So then also one thing to note about HealthShare is that all this sits on top of InterSystems uh, Cache database, uh, both HealthShare and Health Connect. Um, the nice thing about that is the Cache database, which is an object-oriented database, uh, is known to be uh, extremely nimble, uh, fast, and scalable. So, you, so by building HealthShare and Health Connect on the Cache database, you already get the advantage of, of, uh, of those three things that I mentioned before. So with HealthShare, what do you get? Um, so you have Health Connect, which is uh, what we're going to talk about today. That's your integration engine. That's the main driver of you know transporting and transforming and routing your uh, your health data throughout your network. Um, some of the additional features that you can add on to that are the information exchange. So essentially, uh, an HIE. Um, it allows you to create kind of a comprehensive patient record. Um, you can also do some uh, some population health management through the information exchange. And then some of the things that kind of tie on to the information exchange are uh, patient index, so an EMPI. Uh, if that's something that you already don't currently have, you can take advantage of the uh, EMPI that's provided through HealthShare. Uh, personal community, which is essentially it's a patient portal. It allows you to share the information uh, within your information exchange with your population. And then also a health insight, that's your analytics tool. Um, since you're gathering all that information in your information exchange, it gives you the opportunity to really dive into the data that you've accumulated to make better, more informed decisions uh, about your patient population. So next is Health Connect. So Health Connect is your integration engine. It's your uh, health service bus, essentially. Um, this is what's going to allow you to exchange all the different uh, messages that are uh, being exchanged between your different uh, health systems, uh, your PM systems, your lab systems, your radiology systems, your EHRs. Um, this is basically what we're going to go over today. Uh, Ryan kind of mentioned it before, uh, Health Connect Ensemble, they're essentially the same product. Uh, health Connect just has a few additional things that are added to it to make it more healthcare specific. Mainly those uh, healthcare interoperability standards, um, like I, it's IHE certified, it supports HL7, the different versions, CDA, CCD, DICOM, X12, and so on and so forth. 
Um, some of the other things that are kind of included with the Health Connect, so uh, there's business process and workflow management. Essentially, this is going to be your message routing, um, and there's a lot of great kind of visual uh, visualization um, and tools that are used uh, within Ensemble that can really help kind of with your workflow and your business processes. Um, there's data transformation, which is pretty standard for most um, most integration engines. Um, uh, Ensemble has a pretty great tool that allows you to um, to kind of do this pretty easily. All right, so to kind of walk into uh, Health Connect and, and kind of what it's all about, uh, we'll start with the management portal. So the management portal is a web application that allows you to uh, develop, perform system administration and management tasks. Um, the nice thing about the management portal is that it's, uh, it's like I mentioned before, it's a web-based application. So you can have Ensemble or Health Connect installed on a, a single machine or, or a cluster, and you, but you could still access the management portal from kind of any machine that has access to, um, that is part of that network, uh, which is, is pretty convenient for if you have multiple developers uh, that are working on, on the system, or you might have uh, someone who just manages the system administration part of it, and they want to just be able to access that from their local machine instead of logging into uh, the machine where uh, Health Connect is actually installed on. So the few of the things that you could do in the management portal, uh, so like I said, development. So most of your interface development will actually occur within the management portal. Uh, if you can see on the left, you see something called an ensemble. That's going to be the um, the menu that will kind of drive you towards the development side of it. Uh, you have the uh, system operations. So here you'll be able to view uh, some of your monitoring um, functions, uh, your journals, and your logs. Uh, System Explorer, so this is where you can kind of review um, things like classes and globals and, and do some kind of SQL lookup. We're not really going to go into too much detail about that. Uh, I'll touch on classes a little bit later. And then lastly, System Administration. So this is where you would go to actually configure your cache database, handle security and, and license and so on and so forth. All right. Next is a, a production. So a production uh, is your interface. So you've probably picked up on the uh, inner systems ensemble theme. Um, a production is the name of your interface. This might uh, might get you confused. Where a lot of a lot of our clients will name their you know their live environment their production environment. Uh, so when I say production, I don't mean your live environment. A production is. Um, basically your your interface um, or the interfaces that you're developing within the production environment. Uh, so a production is basically uh, composed of uh, three three different business components and adapters. So the business components are business services. Uh, a business service is responsible for kind of retrieving messages from outbound sources. You have business processes. So this is these are going to handle uh, routing your messages, transforming your messages, um, anything that's going to kind of manipulate the message with, in any way. Uh, and then you have your business operation, which is going to be responsible for kind of reaching out, either sending the message outbound um, or actually retrieving uh, some additional information outbound. Um, and then there's adapters. So uh, what adapters do is adapters will kind of sit at, if you were to kind of picture this in your mind, they'd kind of be attached to a business service or a business operation. And essentially they're the, the communication tools to allow those different components to actually communicate with the uh, with your inbound and outbound sources. Um, so some of the adapters that you have are, you know, SOAP adapter, HTTP, FTP, file, and, and TCP. Uh, some of these adapters, uh, kind of have some nice out of the box features where uh, they're pretty, uh, they're very easy to set up. Uh, these are going to be probably handle about 90 to 95 percent of your needs. Uh, there are a few adapters that are available that you just might not see right away in the menu items, such as uh, such as like REST, um, if you want to make some API calls. So message structure. 
So we'll just right now we'll just talk about uh, HL7 schema. Um, it's pretty important to talk about this because this is basically what allows uh, Health Connect to be able to interpret your messages and how it's going to, you know, route your messages and transform your messages. Um, and a big thing uh, with Health Connect is just understanding the idea of uh, your your message category structure and doc type. So a category, so within HL7, uh, the best way to view a category is the versions, the different HL7 versions that have kind of uh, been developed along the years. Uh, mainly people will deal with 2.3, 2.3.1, and 2.5. <laughs> so within the message, uh, the HL7 category, uh, you would then have the option to look at structure. So structure, if you're familiar with HL7, uh, basically is the, it's the outline for how the uh, how the HL7 is actually built out. Um, the different segments, fields, and components are all defined within a, within a structure. Uh, one thing to note when you're dealing with structure in Ensemble is that um, structures are shared amongst different trigger events. Um, so you can kind of see here we have a category of 2.3.1 selected. And on the right, you can see some of the structures. And you can see that the ADTs are, are pretty limited. There's, you know, tons of ADT type trigger events. Um, the reason why the structures are limited is because um, multiple different ADT triggers will share a structure. So for instance, an ADT0, uh, A04 and A08, you don't see this in the structure list. That's because they, same, uh, they have the same structure as an ADT A01. And all this can be viewed within the schema, and I can show you that a little bit later. Um, so what a doc type is, is a doc type is a combination of both your category and your structure. So when you have a doc type associated with your message, the interface engine knows how to deal. It says, okay, I know what version I'm dealing with, and I know the structure of the message. And based off that information, I can parse through that data um, appropriately. So that leads me to a virtual document. So. Like I, I mentioned earlier before that um, Health Connect sits on top of the uh, Cache database. So ca the Cache database works uh, differently than say, um, most of you might be familiar with like a, a SQL, Microsoft SQL. Uh, that's a relational uh, type database. So the way Cache saves information to the database is through objects. So uh, a good example would be um, if you're walking down a street and you look at every house in your neighborhood, each house would be its own object. If you would think of that in maybe SQL, each house would maybe might be saved in a kind of a header table, and then it would break down the house into multiple different tables, um, which is nice for organization, but you can imagine if you have to kind of really reconstruct that house, you have to gather all those that information from the different tables. So the way that Health Connect deals with um, kind of handling a lot of information and parsing through different information without necessarily saving it all to all these different tables is by something called a virtual document. So a virtual document, essentially it just parses through raw data. Um, it allows you to um, basically put a layer on top of your raw data that, that, um, that allows you to kind of dive into the different fields and components uh, without actually having to spread that data without um, throughout multiple, uh, you know, tables and, and columns and rows and stuff like that. Um, so within this particular example, if you look at the top, you could see that uh, I have a doc type of a 2.5 message with a structure, uh, uh, with an ADT A12 structure. Um, and you can see that this is all parsed out. You can see the hyperlinks for each one of these pieces of uh, each field and component. On the bottom is actually example, on the left side is message, uh, message router, and on the right is part of uh, a data transformation. And you could see that I could break down and I can really get down to really um, specific components um, to be able to uh, map different uh, fields to uh, different fields in, if I'm mapping one HL7 version to another HL7 version. So the virtual document allows the interface engine to be able to, you know, parse through that HL7 message and then <clears throat> without having to kind of sift through all the raw data. So next is message processing. 
So now that we've kind of created a schema around our message and the HL, uh, Health Connect can actually interpret that message, um, now we have to worry about, you know, routing, transforming, and kind of getting acknowledgments based off our messages. So there's kind of two ways that um, Health Connect would uh, can route your messages. Uh, one of them is through routing rules, and the other is through uh, business process language, BPL for short. On the left is a, is a kind of a routing rule tool that's uh, provided to you when you, when you uh, create an HL7 interface. Um, it's a really nice uh, UI that will that's kind of pretty easy to use to help uh, manage the different conditions um, on kind of how you want to route your messages, what transformations you want to send your messages to, and then ev eventually what your final uh, end target is. On the right hand side, we have process. Uh, uh, we have a screenshot of kind of a very simple business process uh, built in within the BPL. Um, if you're familiar with Microsoft Visio, uh, you'll be very familiar with how this tool looks. Um, a lot of the uh, a lot of it, a lot of the kind of the icons are, are very similar to how Visio um, how Visio works. Um, it, it gives you one of the nice things about using BPL is it gives you a really, a really good like visual representation of what your messages are doing. Um, you can kind of add free text on explaining what a particular um, action is doing and then kind of where it's where it's heading after that. Um, it's a fairly easy tool to use and and it's pretty powerful. It, it kind of uh, allows you to you know do whatever you want for in regards to routing your messages. So data transformation, obviously with uh, with every interface engine, you gotta be able to transform your messages uh, to kind of help meet your uh, your target system's uh, requirements. So the data transformation, so in the uh, kind of the background screenshot, you can see that I'm just mapping a, um, my doc type and actually in this particular case is uh, something I just named Megalab. Uh, what I did here was I was able to create a customized category and uh, add a Z segment. So I create a ZPA segment. And then I'm just mapping that to a standard 2.3 ORU message. Um, it's a really nice, uh, simple to use kind of drag and drop functional functionality within this tool. Um, some, of the, some of the nice features are, are some of the functions that you're able to kind of add on to your to your uh, source data to be able to uh, make kind of clean and easy transformations. On the bottom right, uh, this is just a screenshot of an exist function. So if you're creating a translation table uh, and you want to run a particular source value against a translation table and you want to see if that value actually exists, um, you can go ahead and just use this exist, exist function. Um, reference the table and then reference your your source value um, to return um, to return a value of, of y or n to see if the value exists or one or zero. I'm sorry to uh, to let you know if the value exists. So just going into a little bit more detail with data transformation. So some of the tools that we've kind of really liked when when we're working with uh, with with uh, Health Connect is um, one of the functions is called strip. So a lot of times when you're dealing with data transformations, you want to get some characters out of the message because your source system just can't handle them or um, <clears throat> they either can't handle them or they just kind of just don't want that in, uh, those characters within their tables. Um, so stripping out kind of punctuation, um, kind of non-alphanumeric characters is, is can sometimes be a headache. Uh, a lot of times you have to work with your vendor and make sure that they're providing you with all the characters that might come across the field and make sure you're doing the appropriate mapping. What the strip function actually does is there's there's some neat tools and, uh, and actions within there that will actually allow you to just strip out all punctuation if you want. So you don't really need to worry about, you know, are they sending dashes, are they sending colons, are they sending parentheses. Uh, you could just strip it all out. Uh, another nice function is the ability, or another nice feature is actually the ability to kind of create your own functions. Um, when you create your own functions, um, you can actually reuse these over all your different um, data transformations um, without having to kind of recode each time. Uh, so kind of in the example below, uh, a function we created was, was get age. You know, a lot of times you might deal with interfaces where your source system is only concerned about, you know, patients 
18 years or older. Um, I have actually worked on an interface like that before. We had to make sure that we captured the age and we were flagging and blocking any of the patients that were under the age of 18. So in this particular example, what I'm just doing is is I'm just setting a value. Um, I would typically probably use a Z segment button here. I used a kind of a random field in the PID segment. And then based off of the value that I get from my get age, I can set that flag to y, YRN. Um, it's a nice, it's it's kind of a nice feature to have to kind of build out these functions and be able to utilize them um, amongst multiple data transformations pretty easily. So acts and next. So <clears throat> acknowledgement, uh, handling kind of acknowledgement messages. So um, this is kind of a really simple feature uh, within Health Connect. So basically, two settings w when you're when you're configuring your interfaces that you you should really kind of focus on when dealing with with acknowledgements. Uh, first is uh, the acknowledgement modes. So there's a couple of different modes that you can choose from. One is never. So if you don't want to send back an acknowledgement, you can set up never. Um, and then the two most popular ones, so there's application and immediate. So what an application act will do uh, versus an immediate act. So the, the diagram on the left is, uh, is, is a really good representation of kind of what's going on. The immediate would be comparable to commit on the, on the left. Um, so what the application act will do is um, it won't send out an acknowledgement until your outbound system has been sent the message. So it assures that the message is kind of trans, uh, traversed through your interface with no issues, no errors before it actually will send the acknowledgement back. If you set it to immediate where you'll get a commit act, as soon as the source system picks up, picks up your message, it's going to send back an acknowledgement. So you would have to determine, you know, with your interface on, on what you want to set up. If, if, if it's very imperative that you make sure that the source system, that your target system gets that data, um, or the person who's sending it wants to make sure that that target system gets that data um, on time, it might make sense to set application. If the source system is just really concerned that you just get the messages, you might want to send it to immediate, depending on the urgency of your data. That's something your organization will just have to figure out. Um, and the last one is MSH determined. So there's certain um, <coughs> fields within the MSH header that will actually indicate how to handle um, the acknowledgments. And then the last one is reply action codes. So this is if you're receiving acknowledgments back. So if you're sending out messages and you you're waiting for an acknowledgement back from your from your target system um, <clears throat> what this feature allows you to do is okay well how do we want to handle those acknowledgements a lot of times you don't really care you wouldn't really want to do anything if if there are no issues but say you get a, a rejection message what do you want to do with your interface so there's a, a few things that you can do um, so on the bottom right, uh, basically the question mark R indicates that I don't care what the first letter of the code is. If I re if the second letter is an R, which means reject, and then the equal, and then you would indicate your actions. So some of the actions that you can have are you can just log a warning. You could retry the message again. You could suspend the message. You can completely disable the operation. So um, if these messages are extremely critical um, and you want to make sure every single one of them gets, gets through um, and you want to stop everything, you could disable the operation or you could just fail or you can fail with an error. So next is monitoring. So how do you monitor your messages going, uh, going through your uh, Health Connect? So the first one is Message Viewer. Um, so this allows you to view, search, and resend messages across kind of multiple different productions. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the one thing I do like about this message viewer is that um, all your interfaces or all your business components, so your business services and your business operations uh, that you set up are all kind of you can, all, you can view all the messages in, in a single message viewer. Um, you would then use um, you, some of the search criteria if you want to really dive down into which source or which target. Um, I worked on interface engines before where you actually have to dive into the actual um, component you're using to be able to kind of search for messages within there. Um, I like the fact that this is kind of all just in one place, and if you want to sort by your source, you could just do it within the basic criteria. 
Um, it also provides extended search criteria. So this is where that virtual document architecture really comes into play. So <clears throat> what you could do is you can really dive into a particular field when searching uh, when searching your messages. Um, if a uh, if your target system or source system comes back and they said, hey, you know, uh, we sent this message, we didn't hear anything back from it, or the target system, um, you know, says, hey, we didn't receive an ADT message for this patient, gives you the MRN, you can go ahead and and search that. Uh, next is actually search table indexing. So this is actually a really great feature uh, to kind of maximize kind of the efficiency of searching for certain things within within your uh, within your interface. So when you're setting up your business services and your business operations, these are your source systems and your your uh, target system target components. Um, what you do is you actually set something, it's called a search table. And what this will do is this will create certain indexes for certain information, uh, common information. And if you search based off of those, those index values, your searches will be much faster. So some of the stuff that's kind of right out of the box are, you know, patient ID, MRN, patient account number, uh, message control ID, uh, a lot of the standard ones that should most likely be able to, you know, uh, help you with, you know, locating the, the, the message that you need uh, in the most efficient way possible. But then you can also go ahead and kind of customize some of these search tables. So actually in the example below, you can see in the bottom left, I have something called a lab search table. So if you're, if you have a, say you're sending some information to a lab or you're receiving information from a lab and you, you're having to go back and forth to the lab a lot. And, and one of the main things that the lab will typically give you is, you know, an accession number for that particular order or, or result. Um, what you can do is you can add that. So that would typically be OBR 3.1. So what you can do is you can add now that value to a search table. So if you want to go ahead and search for OBR 3.1 and they give you the accession number, um, this will allow the search on that particular information to go a lot faster and a lot smoother. We'll, we'll dive into the message viewer also a little bit later in the demonstration. So message trace, so uh, this is found within a few of the logs, uh, message viewer most importantly. Um, so this is a great visual representation of what's going on with your message. Um, so this will indicate your business service, your business process, and, and your operations. Um, there's a legend that's actually provided within the message trace, so um, it'll kind of give you a little bit more of an explanation of what the different kind of shapes and colors indicate uh, when viewing the message trace. Uh, <clears throat> but it will give you a pretty good idea of what's going on within the message. And as you click each one of these, you know, extended rectangles, um, you'll actually see uh, what the message looks at that given moment. Um, so similar to when I was showing the virtual document architecture before, uh, if I clicked on one of these, you could see the HL7 message kind of all parsed out uh, below. Next is the event log. So essentially what this is doing is this is more informational type entries. Um, so system generated events, events. So if you start or stop uh, your production. This is something that's going to be uh, logged here. Um, if you have a business class that you've created and within that class you, you wanted to log something in the event log, you'll find it here. Another thing is it will also log any alerts, warnings, and errors that might be thrown uh, as the message traverses through your, your, excuse me, through your interface or any issues you're having with your production. And then also trace messages. Again, you can, um, what traces are is uh, mainly used for debugging. Um, if you're troubleshooting something, you can kind of add a trace within, say, um, a business component that you're building out uh, because you're, you want to know what sort of value is coming across and that value could be captured here in the event log. The business rule log. So this is simply a log of routing rule activity. Um, so three main things that you really get out of this. So which rule criteria each, each message was tested against. Um, I'll go over that in more detail when we, um, when we go through the demo. Uh, whether or not the message matched that criteria and then what happened to the result. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So on the right side, um, or on the left side, but on the right part of the column where it says return value, this will indicate the different uh, business operations or business processes or, de or data transformations that th the, that particular message was sent to. On the way right, you'll actually see a breakdown of kind of what was going on within the business within the business rules. Um, some of the things that are captured here is obviously, uh, like I mentioned before, well, what criteria was this run against? Um, did it make did it meet that criteria? And then based off whether or not if it did, where is that message going? Uh, there's also debug features in there as well, which I'll show in in the in the demonstration, which will allow you to troubleshoot. Uh, then lastly is system monitoring. So this is a kind of a nice uh, real-time, uh, well, it gives you real-time status of key system indicators. Um, so it'll give you system performance. Uh, one of the key uh, system performance mes um, metrics is something called cache efficiencies. Um, I won't really go into too much detail on that, but um, that's something that you'll you'll kind of want to set a bar uh, within your organization to indicate whether or not your system is is running um, efficient at that time. Uh, also, will indicate you know system uptime and system uh, system down uh, system uptime. You know when was the last time you did a backup? Um, kind of your system usage. So how's the space on on this particular server going? Um, your journal. How big is your journal uh, getting? Um, just to quickly touch base, I'm not going to go into the journaling so much, but a journal is basically uh, a way that captures kind of all the updates you're making to your database. So if there's for any reason your your database goes down, um, this is kind of, it captures all the activity that occurs. So you can, uh, when you restore your database, you can restore your journal and it will make all the necessary updates that have occurred uh, while your database might have been down. Um, this will also indicate some alerts, um, give you uh, an update on uh, what's going on with your licensing, and then also a task manager. So if there's kind of outstanding tasks, it'll kind of give you the kind of the, the, the top tasks that <clears throat> that need to be addressed. So I'm just going to take a quick break, and Ryan is just going to come back with uh, poll number two. Thanks, Phil. Um, so while Phil's grabbing a drink of water, I'm going to introduce our second and final poll question for the day. So is your, is your organization currently evaluating a migration to another integration engine? So yes, uh, within the next three months, yes, within six to 12 months, yes, within the next two years, no, you're currently using Health Connect and everything's awesome, or no, not at this time. And I'll just leave that open for another minute. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Thanks again uh, to those of you who took the time to answer. Um, it looks like it's about to split, so half of our audience is um, currently not looking to migrate, and the next half is looking at a six to twelve, six to twelve month time frame. So Phil, I'll hand it back over to you for the demo. Thanks, Ryan. All right, next part, the demo. All right, so within the demo, I'm going to try and demonstrate a, a, a few things that I feel will be uh, helpful to give you an idea of uh, some of the capabilities of, of using the Health Connect um, interface engine, uh, some of the nice features that I've kind of discovered using it that I kind of want to share with you guys uh, to potentially get you excited about using Health Connect. Um, right now, this production, I'm just going to hop 
real quick just over to the manager and portal just to quickly just with a home page of the manager and portal will give you an idea of kind of what's going on here so again, this was the management portal, which I mentioned uh, before in the slides. Uh, a few additional things to kind of indicate within the management portal um, that I didn't address. Um, it will give you a quick snapshot of what's going on right here on the right. Um, you, right here, I have actually <clears throat> a bunch of different productions that are running. Um, one thing to note is that there's something called a namespace. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but the namespace essentially is it's kind of the hierarchy that stores all your different code and and the databases that are associated with uh, with your with the production that you're running. Um, within a namespace, you're only allowed to run one production, but if you have multiple namespaces set up, you can run multiple productions. Uh, for the most part, you're really just going to have a single namespace and you're going to be running a single production. But if you kind of want to build outside of that and run multiple productions, you'll just have to be aware you'd have to run on multiple namespaces. Uh, but on the right, it'll just give you an indicator what the status of, of your the productions that are most, uh, most recently were kind of loaded up. Uh, another thing to note up here in the, in the title bar, so um, It'll indicate what server you're on, what user you're logged into, the namespace, which is very important as you're kind of navigating throughout the um, um, ensemble. Excuse me, the management portal. Uh, <clears throat> that would only be a concern if you're if you're really jumping between namespaces. Uh, your licensing information, your instance. So your instance is going to be uh, for most people will be say like a dev a test and a production environment or a live environment, not to get confused with the production terminology. So right here on the left, I'm just going to go, uh, I'm going to just jump into a production. So I just go to Ensemble. Um, one thing I really like about Health Connect is how a lot of the stuff is kind of within um, the management portal. Um, you're not, you don't have to jump between um, an ID, uh, a different IDE environment to kind of build out uh, your interfaces. Uh, you do, but not as often as, say, other interface engines. Um, it's also really quick, uh, really easy to kind of navigate through, uh, which is kind of a nice feature to have <clears throat> when you're dealing with uh, with an interface engine that um, where some of the things that you're building in here can get pretty complicated. So within Ensemble, I could just go to Configure. Within Configure, I, I'm just going to hop into Production. And this is how I get to my Productions. So the first thing that I'm going to show is uh, kind of how quick and easy it is to just start off with a really base HL7 interface. Um, this is probably the first thing you'll want to do regardless of if you are building an HL7 interface versus um, exchanging CCDs or any sort of XML document. If your production is going to involve HL7, you'll want to go ahead and kind of build out the base HL7 interface. So what I'm just going to do is uh, production settings. So this just makes sure that my production settings over here is, is kind of at a higher level for productions, actions, and I'm just going to go to new. Um, similar to if you kind of have a computer science background, so a package essentially is a way for you to um, kind of pun intended to, to kind of package your your code and, and your production data into a single um, kind of folder, essentially. Um, so as you're kind of building things out, you might want to, and it, it, they're all kind of similar, you would want to kind of keep them all in the same package. So when you go to kind of review the code um, in, say, the IDE, you would just have to open up that package, and everything within that package is associated, is kind of all related. So in this particular case, I'm just going to, um, you can do a drop down, and you can kind of work off existing ones. So I'm just going to pick demo. It's the, the package name that I was playing around with. Production name, I'll just call this just webcast for this time. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to click HL7 messaging. <clears throat> and what this will do is this will kind of do, uh, produce a few uh, business processes and, and business operations that um, you can develop and add normally, but this will just kind of already develop and add them for you, um, kind of a nice little out-of-the-box feature uh, to make things a lot easier for you. All right, so here we go. So this is just a really standard HL7 message that is is kind of built out for you uh, when you uh, when you choose that option. 
Um, here's your business service, your business processes, and uh, different business operations. And I'll just quickly walk through on kind of what's going on here. Uh, I'm just going to quickly jump into a production that's very similar to this, where a few things are built out. I don't want to waste your time kind of going through some things. So um, it's essentially this, but just with a few settings already, already kind of built out. If I want to hop productions, I would just go back to production settings and go to open. Um, this is where I would find, so this essentially right here is my package. Um, and then you can kind of break down your packages even more. So webcast was the one I've created. Just going to go in this one, it's called new production. I know, very original. <laughs> and I'm just going to kind of dive into some of these services and processes and operations to give you an idea of <clears throat> kind of what's going on here. So business services. Uh, so again, this is your kind of your inbound uh, component, business component. Deals with your messages coming in. So a few kind of important settings is our um, kind of up here. Uh, a lot of this stuff is kind of already kind of pre-filled out for you. Um, a class name. So just give you a little bit of background. So you'll hear the, the terminology class used a lot when, when you're dealing with Health Connect. Essentially, a class is kind of a, a small little program or application that is kind of built out that will pro that does a small little function. Um, so in this particular case, this class, what this is doing is this is building my file service um, kind of business service. Uh, I also have this adapter. Um, it's a file adapter. So this is the application that handles setting up a, a, a file type <laughs> inbound adapter. So a lot of this, when you uh, when you when you kind of create these, you don't need to worry so much about this stuff uh, with the HL7 interfaces. Next, in under basic settings, pretty straightforward. Uh, just indicating your file path, your file spec. So if you only want to pick up certain file types, you can indicate that here. Um, a few kind of important settings down here are. Um, Target config name, so this is where is this message going? Um, so right here, I just have it pointed to my message router. Um, another way to kind of visualize that is if you hit this little button right here, it draws a nice little straight line right there. And then next is also message schema category. So <clears throat> what this will do is this will, you, you actually will need to set this up. And this gives the interface kind of an idea of what message that it's, uh, that it's handling. The reason why you only need to, to indicate the category, so the HL7 version, is because is because the trigger event um, will be sent in the MSH header, um, and a lot of times it's there's no issue with that. You're getting the right trigger event. Um, I've worked in the past where the version um, is either not right, so you might see 2.3, but really they're sending 2.3.1, um, and that that's actually a big difference when it comes to the structure of the message. Um, so what you do is instead of <clears throat> instead of relying on the MSH header uh, for the version, you would just kind of indicate it here, and it's called a category. So next we'll just go over the uh, message router. Oh. Sorry, one other thing I didn't indicate is under additional settings, here's that ACT stuff that I was talking about. Um, what ACT mode, um, right here you would indicate what the kind of the MSH values, three or four or five or six that would be sent back within your ACT. And then also when I indicated the search table. Um, standard is just this standard HL7 search table, but like I mentioned, I created one before. If I want to apply that, I can do that right here. We just jump over to business operations real quick. Very similar to business services. In this case, uh, HL7 file operation. What's my file path when it goes out? And how do I want to structure my file name? Um, there's some documentation online that will kind of indicate what all this, uh, what these characters mean. But that, that kind of basically helps build out your, your file name on the output side. Another nice feature you, you kind of quickly saw pop up is any of the settings you can, and if you hover over them, you can see a question mark. If you click on it, it's just kind of give you a little kind of paragraph on um, kind of what's going on. Um, you can obviously get more detail, but this will give you uh, a quick snapshot of what this feature actually does. 
Before I jump into the message router, just want to talk about some of these other things right here. Uh, ENS alert, page alert, bad message handler. <clears throat> so these are kind of business processes and operations that are, again, kind of out of the box when you create an HL7 interface. Um, an email alert and a pager alert, pretty straightforward. What this does is this allows you to create kind of email alerts. So <clears throat> what you would do is you would set up your SMTP server information and some email addresses, and this will allow you to send um, a warning or an alert or an error uh, to that particular email address. Uh, same with the pager, pager number. Um, bad message handler, so this is a way where if you have a message that kind of fails validation, you can actually have that sent to a particular folder or you can have it routed um, for something uh, to the bad message handler to be processed a different way. ENS alert, it's similar to the message router where this will, when a message fails or has an error, um, it'll kind of route itself to ENS alert if it's enabled, and then within ENS alert, you can say, oh, okay, well, for this particular warning or alert, I want an email to go to um, to a particular group, or I want a pager notice sent to a particular person. So the ENS alert essentially is a message router for your, for your warnings, your alerts, and your errors. So diving into kind of message router, um, pretty straightforward. The main component here is gonna be this business rule name. If I hit this um, magnifying glass right here, this is gonna open up my message router. So this is a really simple uh, kind of routing rule set that I've created just for this demonstration. I'll just kind of go through <clears throat> in a little bit more detail than before. <clears throat> so right off the bat, I just created something called a debug. So debug, what this allows me to do is capture a particular value within a particular field. Um, so here, I want to know what the HL7 uh, MSH 5.1 value is. I might be using that later on within my routing, and I'm troubleshooting something, and I want to capture that value right away. And within my business rule log, you'll actually see that, that information actually being captured. Uh, next are your rules. So here is where you're going to actually uh, kind of set up the meat of, of creating your routing rules. Just indicate a name. Uh, there's kind of two, I guess, two areas where you would indicate whether or not, uh, two, two areas to kind of set conditions. Uh, one of them is a constraint, the other is a condition. So a constraint is at the highest level. We'll uh, what you're doing is you'll say, I only want to look, I only want to worry about messages coming from a particular source that are associated with a particular category and also a different, uh, particular, it says doc name, you could think of that as like an HL7 trigger message. So here I might say, I only want to, I only want to process messages or allow it to go through this, these conditions down here. If it comes from my file service, it's a 2.5 message, it's an ADT A A12 message. Next we have uh, is when, and when is where you'll kind of set your conditions. Uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, you can see here I've kind of indicated, uh, I'm, I'm using kind of two different syntax, syntax here. Um, so you can use uh, kind of standard kind of numeric syntax. So a lot of people are used to saying OBR 4.1, uh, PID 3.2. So you can write your syntax in that version, or if you indicate the category in the doc name, you'll actually be able to, uh, when you fill this information out, it'll, it'll actually start pre-populating for you and it'll allow you to dive into uh, different fields and components and, and kind of give you the full names of those. Uh, with a condition, you can set something called a send. So a send, this is where you're gonna indicate uh, what sort of where you want or what data transformation you want to assign it to, and then eventually what target system you want to send that message to. Um, a return right here will indicate uh, what this says is if I meet these conditions, basically I want to end the whole routing process. If you don't indicate a return here, what it will do is it will then jump to the next rule to see if it meets those conditions. Um, so this is something just to pay attention to when you're building out your your routing rules, you want to say, well, do I want this message to hit multiple different uh, potential routing rules, or am I just really concerned that it hits at least one of them? Uh, 
So that's where you would make sure you configure your returns properly. Uh, on the bottom right down here, I just indicated uh, I'm going to change the doc name. So if I have an AO4, AO8, I'm going to run it against this particular rule. Nothing fancy really built out here. Um, and then down here, I've completely changed the category and the and the doc name is an ORU. And here we have a when and then also an otherwise function. Basically, you don't meet this rule, send everything else here. Very straightforward. And it's a really nice visualization of kind of what your routing rule rules are doing. Um, you don't really need to be an integration expert or an HL7 expert to understand uh, from a high level what's kind of going on uh, here. Uh, next thing is I just want to jump into uh, data transformation. So you see here I've indicated a, a data transformation. If I just go to Ensemble Build, I can see my data transformations. So here's a, a really basic data transformation that I've just created for this demo. Um, I'm just mapping a, a ADT A12 uh, 2.5 message. Again, the A12 is the structure, not necessarily that particular trigger event. <clears throat> what I what this allows me to do is create kind of simple drag and drop kind of functionality, uh, or this has simple drag and drop functionality to be able to do my mappings. Um, Right here, I'm just kind of mapping the whole segment, so I could just kind of do MSH to MSH, but if I wanted to kind of dig down deep into it, I can just kind of go ahead and kind of open up these uh, <clears throat> these items here and, and be able to dig down into the different uh, components and fields uh, within uh, <clears throat> within the, the message structure. Uh, if you see here the brackets, this will indicate that this is actually a repeating segment. So some of the things I just kind of want to display here is uh, some of the functions uh, that I mentioned before. So right here, I'm just using the strip function. Uh, so what he, what I do here is um, when you're mapping something, here I have the PID mapped. Um, if I'm doing any kind of uh, mapping a little bit more specific within the PID segment, you'll just want to kind of put that right underneath the PID segment so it doesn't override it. To add a function, so if you were to double click on say target, so say I just double click on race, uh, let me, <clears throat> you can see here that it set that as the target property right here. Um, if I were to then to highlight it to the value and double click my source value, it would just pop up right in here. If I were to hit this magnifying glass, this allows me to get into using my functions. Uh, here we have the strip function. Uh, this is just a pretty simple uh, logic that will is kind of going to remove any leading zeros. Um, there's documentation um, that I can show you how to get to later um, that will kind of indicate what these different kind of action, uh, what actions there are out there and kind of what these symbols are, are actually doing. So to test some of these tools out, you'd simply, uh, or to test your data transformation, just go to tools and hit test. When I, so right here, I just pasted a HL7 message right here. Hit test. Uh, you'll see indicated right on the left, there's a star. Uh, this will let you know that there was a transformation that took place. So right here, I have a MRN with some leading zeros. You can see it's stripped out there. And then here, I just have a fake social security number just added right here. I put the punctuation strip function on there because um, I didn't want to deal with the... Um, with the dashes, and you can see right here that the dashes are removed. So the test tool is kind of a really nice feature. It's a really quick way to run your messages against data transformations. Um, you can really build out some really complicated data, data transformations, and this testing tool works very quickly. Um, it's probably the quickest one that I've seen uh, using multiple different interface engines. It's a really nice tool to have. If you were gonna go ahead and cre create a data transformation, this is asking me to save something. Again, you would select your package, give it a name, and then you would indicate your source here. Um, these are some of the out-of-the-box kind of source types that are here, but you can go ahead and if you want, if you created your own kind of source type, you can delve in and, and, and find that, that source that you created, that class. Uh, another nice feature with data transformations is something called a... Um, a sub-transformation. 
see, did I create it within here? It's in here. Okay, sorry. So right here, I just have an OBX segment. <clears throat> I'm just mapping OBX segments. Um, if there's a particular segment where you are doing the same mapping over and over for the same um, kind of uh, HL7 version, same doc type, uh, you can go ahead and create a mapping just for that particular segment. And then within your your uh, data transformation for your whole HL7 message, you would just reference that um, <clears throat> that that sub transformation that in this case is OBX OBX uh, mapping and it will just apply that to your uh, to your data transformation. So it, it, it's a way to re reduce a lot of redundancy when you're doing your data transformations. So just hopping back um, <clears throat> into a production. Uh, the next demonstration I'm going to show is uh, I'm actually going to show some messages moving through a route. It's a little bit more complicated. There's some fun stuff in there that, that I found really interesting as I was kind of developing some interfaces. Okay. So this production is going to kind of demonstrate a few things. It's going to demonstrate um, handling XML messages. Uh, a SOAP web service and a web service client, uh, business process logic, um, SQL queries and calling a SQL store procedure. So that's kind of all included here. Um, so I'm just going to kind of quickly go through go through some of this and show you uh, show you what's going on. So I'm just going to quickly just start this production. All right. So. I've shown you the message router. I'm going to skip that part. Um, what I really want to show you is this BPL, this business process, process logic. So in the screenshot I showed you earlier, um, this is what we, we saw before. Um, some of this stuff doesn't actually need to be in here, but I can kind of let you know what, what it's doing. Uh, <clears throat> so again, this is a nice kind of visual representation for routing your messages. Um, a BPL is really nice. So a message router is really great if you want to route your message based off of data that's within your HL7 message or within whatever sort of messages that you're sending. So if there's something within that message you can use to route your message, the message router is a perfect tool for you to use. If there's something a little bit more, so in this particular case, um, I want to make a SQL call. Um, I have a, a database where I'm storing some information and I want to see, and based off of information in that database, I want to route my messages a little bit differently. Uh, or maybe I want to apply a little bit of additional logic to the message before I decide where I want to route that message. Business process logic is the easiest way and the nicest way to do it. Um, and it's also pretty intuitive, uh, and it's it's a really nice visual. Uh, it's a really good way to kind of show someone who, again, who might not be familiar with HL7 or integration engines of what's going on. So just because this is important to the demonstration, I'm just going to quickly touch on what this is doing. Uh, when my message first gets routed to my business process, uh, my BPL, uh, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be making a SQL query. That SQL query is then going to return um, <clears throat> a value back. Based off of that value that's coming back, I want to—I have a condition here, an if condition, if else condition. And I'm saying, well, if that return value, in this case is patient count, equals zero, if it's true, I'm going to send it down this route. If it's false, I'm going to send it down this route. Pretty straightforward. If it's true, which means that my patient isn't in this particular table, I'm going to go do do here is actually create a uh, call a SQL store procedure. Uh, I'm going to send some information over that store procedure, and that store procedure is going to add that patient to my table. Once that is done, it's just going to send it to my message router. If the patient does exist, false, it's just going to send it directly to my message router. It's going to close some of these up here. So, <clears throat> so let me just go ahead and I'm just going to drop a message in. All right. 
So in order for me to see that message, there's a couple of different, what I want to do is I want to go to the message viewer. Um, a couple of different ways to get there. Uh, one is you can click the uh, any of the business components and hit messages. This will get you to the message viewer. Um, I'll just go ahead and do that. One thing to note is that if you jump into the message viewer from a particular component, um, it's automatically going to kind of filter out based off that component. I'm just going to remove that right now. There's a few additional things I want to show you. So when you're, when you're in the message viewer, uh, you'll see right here that I have this session ID. You can see I kind of have a, I have a, this number here, there's a couple of different, about nine, nine different rows here uh, with this 3217. One of them is green. Uh, green will indicate the start of my session. Um, so this is going to show you the message as it kind of hits each different um, component, business component, kind of what's going on. Uh, a lot of times you don't really need to see that. So a nice thing we I like to do is just do session start. Kind of narrows it down. So what happened to my message? So if I went here, um, I see the header. Uh, the header, this is basically, uh, this is standard information that is just captured uh, regardless of what type of message you're sending. Anything that goes within uh, through Health Connect Ensemble uh, is going to have the same kind of header. Body captures a, 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 some additional uh, metadata as well. You can see the raw HL7 message here. Content, this is uh, obviously the HL7 message that went through. Uh, and what I want to show here is the trace. What's, what went on with this message? So here's a nice visual representation of what went on. <clears throat> so right here we have a business service. We had the from HL7 service. This was just a file service that picked up my message. Went here, picked up my message, and sent it to my business process logic. Business process went through. Remember in the beginning of the business process logic, I said we're going to make a SQL query. That SQL query is is part of a, a, a business class or a class called check patient list. So this is going to go at that business class is going to make my SQL call. Within that business class, I actually created a trace. So right here, I could see a value. So if I'm troubleshooting, what value is going across? In this case, I was taking the patient identifier. Here's my return value. Okay, my record count equals zero, which indicates my patient doesn't exist. Next is, I'm going to call that store procedure. So it's going to send that message. It's going to make a store procedure call. Within that store procedure, I have a return status. It says, it indicates, okay, a patient has been added. Once that patient has been added, the message is then going to be forwarded to my uh, message router. Uh, that message router is called from HL7 router. Pretty straightforward. And then it's going to send my message to my SOAP web, web client here. That's going to send out an acknowledgement. Here's my acknowledgement message. Uh, one thing to note here, um, you could see that my acknowledgement right here did not go back directly to my business service. Um, the reason for this is that typically you wouldn't have a BPL sent to a message router. Um, essentially, the message router is viewing the BPL as the source, so that's where the, the uh, message is going back to. It's not really that big of an issue because what you could do is capture that acknowledgement, send it back to the business service, and, and this indicates that the acknowledgement went out. So if I were to go into my, my, my SQL database right here, uh, this is that table I set up, you could see that that patient was added right here. And this is just that simple SQL uh, store procedure I created. Um, and then patient added, this is the status that is being returned. Now what if I go ahead and just drop the same message in? Again, hits my BPL, checks for the patient. Oh, record count one, that patient already exists, so I'm not going to worry about that store procedure. I'm just going to go ahead and send to my web service call. So right here we have the uh, web service client that I actually created. Um, the interesting thing here is that this is my client and this is my service. Um, so essentially this message is doing a nice little loop. It's going from here, hitting my business operations SOAP client, and then getting picked up by my SOAP web service right here. 
and then just simply just going to this lab uh, operation right here. Setting this up is pretty straightforward. Uh, right here, just indicate the web service URL. Um, if the service requires credentials, you can actually save the credentials uh, in under uh, system operations. No, system system operations. Nope, ensemble. Sorry, it's it's in the same kind of menu where the production is. Uh, if you have any sort of SSL configuration, you can indicate that here as well. That's for my web service. And this is my web service client. Um, so to set up an HL7 web service, web service, uh, pretty straightforward. This one took me probably about five minutes to create. Um, you can also use SOAP UI to do any troubleshooting to send through here. Um, you can actually see in my message trace that here's that message getting picked up. Here's my SOAP message. Here's my SOAP web service picking up the message and then sending it to the lab. So pretty nice feature right here. Real quick, um, I also have an XML one. I'm not really going to show you how this is going through, um, but say you have an HL7 message and you want to make a stored procedure call, but you have to make some modifications to that message. Well, what you want to do is you don't want to modify the HL7 message. You don't want to do that. You really want to modify the you know, something that can then be uh, picked up by the by the business operation making that SQL call. So a nice thing to do would be HL7 do, say like an XML. So you can create a really quick XML schema uh, using this XML schema over here. Um, you just quickly upload an XSD file with the XML schema and you can go ahead and use it. I'm just gonna show you the data transformation real quick kind of running a little, a little low on time, so I apologize if I'll uh, try not to skip too much here. So here I have my HL7 message and my uh, XML schema. I'm just doing a few modifications, stripping out leading zeros, stripping out any punctuation. I can go ahead and test this. See, I've stripped out the leading zeros for my uh, PID value and a hyphen here, remove that, and uppercase everything. So now I can just use this file to be able to make my store procedure call. Um, so it's a really nice way to simplify your data transformations when you're trying to uh, make, make a store procedure call. Okay, so I believe um, that's it for the demonstration. Um, just quick thing to note, uh, down here on the system tray, this is where you would kind of access the management portal uh, from the server. Um, you can access the documentation here, which I'll show you in just a moment. Terminal, so this is just a command line prompt uh, that you can use to quickly get some quick information. Um, and then Studio. Studio is actually the IDE. Um, this is where you would go ahead and, and create your business classes. Um, <clears throat> Uh, for your for your interfaces, and you can also view uh, the business classes that are already um, that have already have been developed. So okay, Ryan, did you want to chime in? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, nice job, and we have about 15 minutes um, yep. or so left for questions. Um, so we had a couple, couple come in while you're presenting. Um, the first question we have is, how does Health Connect or Health Share handle uh, CCD documents? All right, <laughs> good question. Um, so let me just pop back in my demonstration. Real quick, documentation. Uh, you can access the documentation for all the InterSystems products on docs.intersystems.com. Quick Google search will bring you here. Um, this thing is filled with tons of really great information uh, for helping you build interfaces and, and dealing with cache and ensemble and all that. Sorry to go that, through that really quickly, but if you would like to explore um, the InterSystems documentation, it, it's freely available online for everyone to get to. Okay, so I actually have a, a quick route that I could just show you, or not route, but uh, production. Uh, here we go, CCDA. 
Okay. <clears throat> so how does how does Health Share or how does Health Connect handle CCDs? Um, <clears throat> so what they do is um, so InterSystems kind of did a they were kind of brilliant where um, they created something called an SDA. So it's a uh, it stands for Structured Document Architecture. And essentially what this is is um, it's an XML schema that kind of kind of is a standard that they've created that you can kind of work off of. And, and really, what does that mean? So um, in this particular example, maybe we have an HL7 message, and we want to transform that to a CCD because my source system wants a CCD or a C32 document. Well, it could be extremely cumbersome to map an HL7 message to a CCD. Um, CCDs can, can be pretty complicated. They're pretty large. Um, there's multiple fields. There's a lot of kind of redundant data that's within the CCD, and um, and that would take a lot of time and a lot of uh, um, a lot of kind of yeah, just a lot of time to be able to figure that out. So, what does Health Connect do? Um, so, with the SDA, um, what Health Connect will do is they will map an HL7 to an SDA. So, an SDA is a really basic kind of uh, like I mentioned XML document. And then, based off of the information within that SDA, they're going to do the work and they're going to actually build out the CCD for you. Um, there's some nice classes that are already built. So if you if you want to map an HL7 to an SDA, there's already functionality in there to do that. You don't actually need to do the mapping. Um, then there's style sheets that will <clears throat> transform an SDA um, to a CCD and different, uh, different versions of CCDs and CDAs and stuff like that, which I can actually show you real quick. Okay, so within this folder, you're going to see um, a bunch of different style sheets that you can use. <clears throat> so essentially, this is a plug-and-play type of model. Once you have your message formatted to an SDA, you just would apply a particular style sheet, and it's going to create the CCD to the industry specs. So we have a CCC, CCDA CCD, a CCDA clinical summary, um, an export summary, um, a lot of the standard ones, uh, a CDA to a C32, uh, which I believe is an IHE standard, um, and a few other things that, that I haven't used, but, but you have the capability of being able to use these different uh, style sheets to make your transformations. So I can actually show you real quick what, what this kind of looks like. So just kind of doing some testing in the in the past and, and kind of doing some um, digging into how the SDA works in CCDs. Um, I've actually branched it out and actually produced an SDA and a CCD for you guys to actually take a look at. Um, I could use a previous example on uh, from here. And I believe I actually have something similar already up. Okay. So here I have, uh, I have an SDA document right here. Um, there's a lot of information in here, but uh, as you can see, this is a lot kind of easier to navigate compared to, say, a, uh, a CCD. And like I mentioned before, there's already kind of out-of-the-box tools to map an HL7 to an SDA. If you have to make some changes, uh, there's actually you can actually use the data transformation to make those changes. Um, and then here I have the CCD that is actually produced by that SDA. So it's a really nice feature, um, makes handling CCDs a lot easier than, and, than some of the other interface engines um, kind of out there in the market. They kind of <clears throat> kind of really did their homework with the stuff and, and made it as easy as, as possible to be able to develop these sort of, sorts of things. Any other questions, Ryan? Yep, we just have one more. Um, it's kind of a generic question. So uh, what skills would you should suggest brushing up on uh, to be able to effectively develop on Health Connect? Sure. <clears throat> so one of the big differences between 
Ensemble or Health Connect and some of the other interface engines is, um, you know, it's built on the cache database and that database is built off of, of using, um, it's an object oriented uh, type database. Um, and a lot of the programming is, is object oriented. Um, cache and Health Connect actually use a language called uh, cache object script. Um, there's also a few additional other languages, but that's the main one they use. Uh, it's based off of the old mumps language. Um, <clears throat> it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, you know, if, if you, like I said, if you have an object oriented programming background, uh, you should be able to pick it up pretty quickly. There's a lot of information on the documentation on how to use it. Uh, a lot of the classes that are developed are actually already built out. Um, so a lot of it is, uh, a lot of the development would be kind of working off of existing classes that are already built. Um, so while it would be nice to have that sort of thing, um, if you don't have that sort of background, um, either discussing it with someone you know who has object-oriented uh, programming background or picking up a simple book, just to kind of get an idea of kind of what's going on, how do you handle objects within within a programming language, that, that should really help you out. But don't allow that to deter you from getting into Health Connect. Um, it's really simple language to kind of pick up and understand um, and makes programming a lot easier. Uh, it also opens up a lot of opportunity within the engine. You essentially can create your own little applications uh, within within the database, <clears throat> uh, which is which is really nice. Um, gives you a lot of freedom. Um, and you you won't you won't really feel restricted at all when you use this interface engine. Yeah, I think one of the one of the important things to highlight is, um, you know, while Object Script is the kind of underlying um, programming language, you can do a lot in the in the UI. Um, you know, most of the kind of day to day, uh, you know, functions or operations or, or transformations you need to do um, are really available just point and click, and um, you know, with some configuration. Yeah, Ryan, good point. Yep. So with the message router, the data transformations and all that stuff, the business process logic, most of that can be done without really having to delve into um, dealing with code. Um, so uh, a lot of your interface development doesn't need to be, uh, you don't really need to worry about uh, the, the object scripting as much. All right, um, so at this point, uh, we're running pretty late. So if there are any other additional questions that are out there, um, feel free to kind of post them now if they've been posting during the presentation and I'll get back to you uh, with as much detail as I can for those responses, uh, hopefully by the end of the week. Um, and again, thank you all for, uh, for, for joining this presentation. Um, just to note, um, so again, yep, thank you. Uh, we actually do go ahead and post these webcasts online. Um, Ryan, you, you might be able to have to fill me in on, on when typically we get these up there. Um, and then also, if you also want to reach out to us about any of our services or products, uh, you can just go to our website under About and hit Contact Us, and, and that's a way to, to reach us if you uh, have any questions. So again, thank you all for, uh, for joining. Uh, and being patient, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.